Okay, so I think that we are more or less all the people. Uh, good morning again. I am Angela Magno from Bayasul. Uh, today I will be the moderator of the webinar. Uh, I welcome to the DGC Press uh, workshop. Thank you again to, to be here. Uh, we are so pleased. And as most of you know, uh, our project is regarding the digitalization, digitalization of the supply chain of fruit and vegetable. Today, we want to share with you our technology, our research, and also the commercial uh, perspective that we have with our uh, research during this uh, more than half a year. And uh, let me just give you a short uh, overview uh, about our project. Uh, this is the, the agenda of the workshop. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we are going to record this webinar. Uh, we will share with all of you uh, maybe in one, one week. And uh, we will see the, the DigiFresh logistic that we will be explaining about Alexandru Luca from Aurish University, who is the coordinator together with Merete de Melbourne uh, from Aurish University. Also, we have the part of the more focusing the research from Martin Ertok from Q11. He's going to explain explaining better to us the digital twin and the prediction of self life that we made during the, the project. And uh, together with uh, Alexandru, that is going to explain the validation of our uh, approach with the different research and the, with the different budget that we, we have researched in this time. Finally, we have the more the commercial perspective uh, from Giri Shansi from Xsense, that is our exploitation partner, and he's going to talk about the impl implementation of this DigiFresh logistic. So, just a quick facts about the project. DigiFresh uh, is an innovation project co-funded by the 80 Foot. Sorry? Angela, we cannot see anything. You're not oh, yeah, sharing. Yes. No. I cannot. I think yeah, that no, no I, I can see it. I cannot. I also can see. No problem. Okay. Uh, just thank quick, you. Quickly go move out and come back in, uh, Alex. Okay. I think yeah. that uh, I'm going to stop and share again my screen just to those. And indeed, if the problem is just with Alex, he's, uh, I think that he's very familiar with this presentation. <laughs> okay, so I, as I was mentioned, uh, DigiFresh project is an 80 foot innovation project co funding by the 80 foot and the European Commission. We are a consortium of four partners. Aurus University is the coordinator, as I said previously, and we have also Q11, Xsense, and uh, Bayasul, as me. We are a uh, SME from Spain. We are a water engineering and a technological consultancy. And together, we built a, a strong uh, partnership to try to develop and uh, implement the difference logistic uh, in a, a context that finally we will have a product that could be commercialized. Um, so I think that more or less uh, that is. And now is the turn of Alex uh, to explain a little bit our approach. Alex, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, in the first part, I would like to talk about the need for solution that we have developed in Digifresh. And to start with, I would like to show some uh, figures about food waste. And um, uh, if we zoom in, we can see uh, how the food waste or waste of fruits and vegetables is distributed in different regions of the world and uh, where it is created. So if we take Europe as an example, 
around 20% of food uh, of fruits and vegetables are lost in uh, in uh, growing in agriculture and then around 30% are lost in uh, the distribution and consumption so uh, there might be different reasons why uh, fruits and vegetables are not consume and become waste in agriculture. This could be like some climate conditions or some regulations on size and shape and uh, uh, micro disease outbreaks and stuff like this. Uh, but when it comes to post harvest part of it, uh, to distribution and consumption, again, many different reasons and in improper storage um, lack of uh, uh, ma management in the supply chain, consumer behavior, they're all here, they're all different. And of course, it's not only what we want to discuss today, so there are a lot of different reasons, but let's focus on one of them, and that's uh, lack of knowledge on freshness and lack of shelf life or best before date on, uh, on packages or uh, on fruits and vegetables in general. Um, I would like to show um, supply chain and it, this this time it's a little bit different as this workshop is about digitalization of the supply chain. I would like to show a digital supply chain. It can help us oversee what is there and what we still are lacking. So if we start from the farmer, a uh, farmer can uh, send their produce via transporter to a warehouse and there are different solutions, digital solutions available um, to monitor and even control the conditions during transportation. Uh, when it arrives to warehouse, uh, the personnel there can, um, they can check the performance of each transportation uh, they also have a chance to communicate with the farmer if something went wrong. Um, they also, by analyzing data, could potentially understand parameters which affect quality. Um, but is this done in, in reality? We don't know. It depends because you really need a, an expert person to analyze all the data that it comes in to to make these decisions and conclusions and what is definitely not there yet it's uh, shelf life as if we talk about unprocessed fruits and vegetables and then after warehouse the produce is sent to the shops and um, again there might be some uh, digital solutions for this part of the supply chain uh, the shops can communicate to warehouse if they're having problem with the produce, make complaints, and the same warehouse can make complaints to transporter and to farmer. But what is really what we would like to focus today is uh, neither the shop uh, personnel or consumers know how fresh these uh, fruits and vegetables are. So there are two questions that we try to answer in this project. Is it possible to determine shelf life based on the conditions in this part of the chain or in also considering this part? And can we determine this freshness? And um, I would like to show one, one solution that is like, it's more logistic management, but it's closely related to digitalization. And you will see this in a minute. Uh, you might be familiar with uh, two concepts uh, used in uh, in management and logistics management. These are called FIFO and FEFO, and I would like to explain them uh, by this example. So imagine that there are uh, different farmers and uh, trucks uh, bringing uh, produce from them arriving uh, on three uh, on three consecutive days and in agile world of course there would be a best before date for each of the product in this track but if it's in case of fruits and vegetables this information is not known 
So what is done in case of FIFO, which is first in, first out, if uh, that this first truck arriving, the purple one, ar arrives first, it the produce from this truck should leave first the warehouse and go to the shop. And then it's from blue that arrived second, then this produce is placed in second order and third consecutively the, from the truck that arrived the last. When it comes to first expired, first out, then the produce from these batches or these transportations, they are sent based on best before date. So in this case, the blue, the produce from blue truck should go first to the shop and the produce from the purple truck should go the last because it has the longest best before day. And this is where we started with Digifresh. This is what uh, what was inspiring. Can we transform uh, the supply chain from first in, first out into first expired, first out? And now I'd like to show a few slides about Digifresh project. Um, I'd like to start with uh, uh, with the work plan. We had uh, six work packages uh, in 2021. We had activity management and exploitation uh, plan and specification for the uh, for the digital twin tool. Then we had a work package on development and validation of digital twins and. Uh, we will hear more in the next slide about this work package. Uh, we then, after the models were developed or the digital twins were developed, they were uh, incorporated in uh, Accent's existing uh, software. And so a Digifresh digital platform was created. It was further validated. Uh, by doing some trips and again you will see the results from the validation tests not in this presentation but um, in the, the upcoming one and finally we have dissemination and communication activities where we publish different articles and uh, perform workshops attending different uh, symposium uh, well this was one year work and we could clearly see that it's not enough for such uh, big expectations that we had. So we applied for an extension for one more year to AIT Food and it was accepted. So in 2022, we had five additional packages. Uh, again, we had activity and exploitation related and commercialization related packages. Um, then we had a work package on expansion of Digifresh potential. In this case, we included new produce and we tried to figure out how we can improve the models that were developed there last year, uh, that they become stronger in their prediction performance. Of course, uh, by obtaining new models, updated models, uh, we conducted demonstration uh, we, yeah, we updated the, the digital platform and conducted demonstration studies. And again, finally, we have uh, a communication and dissemination activity. A uh, little bit about what we worked with. And um, we have chosen three model products. One of them was strawberries because they are highly perishable. Uh, they are a good model product for microbial spoilage and uh, loss of glossiness, that's what we observe also as consumers. And uh, if you go into literature, you'll find a lot of articles on modeling shelf life of um, strawberries. Another product was lettuce, again, considered as highly perishable, a good model product for studying wilting. Lettuce does also lose quality due to microbial storage. And uh, uh, finally, uh, yeah, uh, we also, when it comes to strawberries, like we had methods uh, available to to monitor different quality as uh, parameters. When it came to lettuce, we had to develop some new, maybe simple, but 
working methods. So here you can see an example of uh, how we determine wilting. That's just by using gr Earth gravity. It helped us. Um, um, finally, we have chosen uh, to work with broccoli. Again, it's considered that it's highly perishable. It's very different from lettuce and strawberries, as this is an inflorescence. And uh, it's a good candidate to study senescence, but it also does lose quality due to microbial uh, spoilage. And in this case, we have also developed uh, new methods to monitor quality, and that was how to determine senescence using multispectral imaging technique. Uh, yeah, that's all for the first part. And now you're going to hear uh, more from Martin Hertog on uh, modeling part of this project. So I stop my presentation. And if you have questions so far, maybe we could answer one, two quick questions. If not, we can compile all the questions at the at the end because it seems that that we from now uh, is there are no questions. So Martin, is your turn? Okay, then I will uh, get started. Thanks uh, to be here for uh, this workshop on the the Digifresh uh, project. So I'll be. Explain a little bit more about the uh, the modeling that has been uh, implemented uh, during this uh, project, um, how we use it to uh, predict uh, shelf life, and what the underlying assumptions and also some of the limitations uh, are. So let it be clear, we don't have yet our final, final, final version. This is something that needs still work for over the coming years to come as well. So um, as uh, Alex uh, outlined, the uh, Digifresh project um, um, had its ambition to combine existing technologies with what we call the, the smart digital twins. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that we can use those digital twins, those models, to translate the storage conditions that are measured by the, the sensors in uh, during the transport. Uh, into a remaining shelf life term. In this way, then the owner of the uh, product can, um, well, keep an eye on the transports and uh, take actions as needed. So the whole idea is that we set up a system where um, on one hand you have your perishable uh, product having certain characteristics in terms of an initial quality, in terms of typical rates of uh, quality decay, um, and then you have the conditions by the environment, the way we treat, uh, cherish or abuse uh, the product, uh, and then we have a model that brings it all together and that is actually trying to numerically interpret how the environment is affecting the change of quality throughout the uh, logistic chain. And this will help then the end user to evaluate the performance of his transport or whatever he has been doing to the product. So, of course, we can't expect an individual company to uh, interpret this and that's where this tool comes in to facilitate this whole process. Of course, the first question then is what is quality? So like Alex explained, we focused on uh, a number of uh, products, each having their own relevant uh, quality attributes. And it means that um, yeah, we'll have to focus on um, those uh, aspects. Um, so of course, as an end user, you're just judging the products as a whole, um, but uh, in a bit of a scientific approach, you would have to measure those properties and as preferably measure them in an objective uh, way. Uh, but these are the typical things like size, color, uh, microbial uh, rots, uh, and things alike, the wilting as mentioned. So 
to explain a little bit further, we go back to some um, already old concepts on um, keeping quality um, developed by uh, Sloof and Tyskens uh, in Wageningen years ago, where they basically state that, OK, you have two sides of the story. You have the product side where you have measurable uh, properties that can be affected by the physical surrounding. And then you have the consumer looking at it um, to judge whether he likes or dislikes the product. And while he is looking at a product, there's a whole process going on of what we call quality assignment. And what is playing a role is, well, the background of the person. Um, who is he? Um, when is he looking at it? Are we looking at uh, strawberries in summer when there's lots of strawberries uh, or when we're looking at strawberries in winter time when we haven't seen them for months and large expectations are raised when seeing the first strawberry? Um, of course, what then is important is the application. How do you want to use the product? Is it for eating fresh? Is it for putting on top of a pie? Or is it for deep freezing? Then depending on the application, you will have different expectations and you will be looking for different quality aspects. So all of this translates into different quality limits. For every quality attribute, you will say, OK, it needs to be higher or lower than this particular limit value. If not, I can't accept it. And that will then result in an overall judgment of the product. So while we try to make it explicit in terms of the underlying properties and the quality attributes, of course, definitely a consumer is looking at the overall uh, picture, but also the other partners throughout the chain will be looking at um, the complete uh, picture of quality. So this is where uh, the digital twins come into play uh, to basically try to predict how the product will be behaving. Well, first, let's. Uh, what is a digital twin? A digital twin is basically a digital uh, copy of something in real life um, that tries to mimic whatever is going on in real life, but in such a way that we can um, simulate this in the computer without a need to have the actual product available. Of course, this requires to have a digital representation, a model, a simulation model of uh, the, the thing you want to, uh, to analyze. In our case, this would be a perishable fruit or vegetable. And um, yeah, you can make those digital twins as complex as you want, but the main uh, thing in the end is that it needs to be able to mimic those aspects you are interested in that are relevant for your case. So um, you need to, from reality, try to uh, decompose the problem into smaller sub problems. You start to describe them. You make abstractions of reality. And based on that, you come up with some uh, algorithm describing it. Well, in literature, there are many ways how this has been done, which can go up to a high level of uh, realism. Um, the magnetic models where, for instance, this is a model about um, a firmness, but this is a model where they try to include all the enzyme activities and they're looking at the impact of enzymes at the different cell walls uh, characteristics, um, even starting from uh, ethylene level. But of course, you can wonder whether this is not a bit of an uh, overreaction if you want to model firmness for a digital twin in a logistic uh, context, then you definitely will not be able to uh, calibrate such a detailed model. So because of that, uh, you'll have to go to uh, more simpler models that still are somehow based on the underlying reality, but are much uh, more of a lumped approach and I will be easier to calibrate in the end in the daily industry practice. Um, so we limit 
the process to the essentials. In this case, an example of a, of a color uh, model. Of course, this is then focusing on the kinetics of color change, so describing the color in this case of tomato. But we even want to go a step further. So in the end, we're not interested in specifically color. Like we said, we're interested in the shelf life, the keeping quality of the product. And for that, we then go back to an approach taken by uh, Tyskens, where um, he has been modeling the keeping quality of a product as a function of uh, different storage temperatures, where you can see that in the case of um, a thing like uh, lettuce, the higher the temperature on the horizontal axis, the lower the keeping quality will be at that particular temperature. Another product like tomato might have actually an optimal temperature. If you go too high, the keeping quality goes down. If you go too low because of chilling injury, it goes down as well. So this is a very simple approach, but it does capture the elements that we want to cover. So in the end, um, we've chosen for this approach, but we've chosen for an, uh, an approach based on this that also has been extended not only to time and temperature, but also to other conditions like humidity and uh, in theory also the, the gas composition um, in the transport uh, surroundings or the storage surroundings. So it's a simple model, it's generic. It basically can deal with multiple quality aspects. It strongly depends on the limits that you apply um, and it's, it, incorporates the impact of different environmental uh, factors. Just um, to show how it has been applied in the past, where we looked at uh, the impact of temperature and, and gas conditions. So actually, we see here that over time, spoilage goes up. Uh, it goes up in over time and it goes up as a function of temperature, high temperature. You have a very steep increase. And if you then think of a certain threshold limits, let's say at 5% of spoilage, uh, the higher the temperature, the earlier spoilage development goes through this threshold and therefore your keeping quality uh, becomes less. So you can look at it through a spoilage model, but you can also look at the same data through a keeping quality model. And in that case, you don't model spoilage, but you model the resulting keeping quality. And in that way, you can actually show how over time, while the fruit goes through a certain transport chain, uh, you start losing shelf life. If you, in chain B, it's a cold, uh, low temperature chain, you don't lose shelf life that rapidly. So even though originally, at standard uh, temperature of 18 degrees, you would have only three and a half days of shelf life, but because you transport it, let's say at four degrees, you can actually have it last for seven days at four degrees before your quality runs out. But of course, in another chain that is less well controlled, it runs out much faster. And this is a concept we captured here in our uh, project as well. So um, we did, start from the specific quality models. So looking at strawberry, we had gloss, sepal quality, spoilage, water loss and firmness. We've done um, in Denmark uh, lots of experiments, storing fruit from different weeks at different temperature scenarios. And then uh, we get those uh, quality results, just a short uh, example on spoilage, weight loss and gloss. And then we can see how we can fit those the individual quality models to it. But like I said, we don't want to use those quality models. We want to use the days of shelf life till the quality goes through some threshold. So here in yellow, I put on the threshold levels. And you can see that with regard to spoilage, after around two days, you are uh, crossing the limit of 5%. For weight loss, it's just under two days. And for gloss, we even don't get to the threshold. So gloss is not a rate limiting factor. It's either spoilage or weight loss. In this case, it's uh, actually uh, the weight loss. And this 
last pad is the one that we want to use in the uh, DigiFresh approach. So another example here for the romaine lettuce, some information on the wilting uh, angle that uh, Alex showed. So it takes up to uh, 10 days to really um, lose uh, its quality for this particular batch. Uh, while for weight loss, it's already ar around seven days. And in this case, for a U angle, it's also around uh, nine to 10 days. So depending on the product, all the quality attributes are involved, each quality attribute having its own threshold level, and now the challenge is to bring it all together in the generic shelf life model. So what do we do? We use the original models to predict the keeping quality, the shelf life, at a range of different conditions. Um, and then we calculate for each of those quality attributes the number of days that the product would be acceptable. So for weight loss, it would be, for this particular example, only 0.3 days, spoilage 0.8 days, sepal quality 1, gloss 8 days, firmness 0.68 days, so what do we learn from this simulation? That weight loss here is the rate limiting factor. So for a given set of temperature humidity, actually, uh, so this must have been a high temperature and a low humidity level, the weight loss is a rate limiting factor. We can do those simulations for hundreds of times to cover the whole range of temperature humidity conditions, and that creates basic data set that we use for uh, fitting then the generic uh, shelf life model as developed by Taskins. And that gives us a match of about 96%, so that's fairly well. And if we now use not the individual quality models, but we use the generic model to simulate a logistic chain, we get a single output that will tell us for this particular chain, starting from a quality of three days shelf life after one day of transport um, where we are actually at uh, something like um, let me see uh, close to uh, zero degrees the quality goes down quite slowly but then we move into a phase where we go to 25 degrees and uh, the humidity drops down to around 70 to 80 percent that's when we rapidly start losing uh, our shelf life. And then actually around one and a half day, we get through zero. In other words, telling us this product is no longer acceptable. So this is the final uh, model that is implemented in DigiFresh, which is based on the underlying models of the different quality attributes. But there are clearly some uh, challenges and limitations here. One thing is which quality attributes to choose. So we've chosen some, uh, but maybe if you talk to different partners in the chain, they might have different ideas about it. Of course, then what critical levels do you use? So we've based on our experience, we've chosen certain levels, but you can imagine that a partner early on in the chain might have different criteria than, for instance, the end consumer. So this needs to be carefully designed with your end user in mind, who is going to use this platform and to work with then those attributes and those critical levels that they are interested in. Also, it requires standardization. If you want to roll out a system uh, with international clients, um, they need to use the same vocabulary on what is quality and what limits do we expect from the system. Another aspect that we tackled in the past half year is the role of packaging. Uh, it depends whether you work with an open crate of product or whether you work um, with um, uh, an consumer packs because if you put a foil and a package around it, this will buffer the heat and mass transfer. So um, to deal with this, we designed a lumped uh, model approach um, that we can use to get some further insight in, for instance, heat transfer and uh, water loss. Why I'm saying this? Well, normally 
these sensors are put in the outside of the uh, package. But of course, the temperature measured at the outside of the package is not necessarily the product temperature. So you need to take into account, um, well, the, the models were developed as a function of product temperature. So here you see an example, the blue line is the temperature in the room, which can go up quite rapidly and goes down quite rapidly. But if you look inside the strawberry punnet, the air underneath the lid uh, will already go a bit slower. But when you would measure the fruit temperatures of a couple of fruits uh, in this package, you will see that there is much more delay in the heating up and the cooling down of those individual fluids. Knowing we have the air temperature as an input from the sensors, uh, if we would ignore this delay, we would be um, yeah, a bit, uh, we would be wrongly predicting what's happening uh, to the fruit. So for that reason, we included um, a very simple model to describe this uh, heat transfer and the impact of, on product temperature. And we have um, calibrated that on the particular data, in this case for punnets of uh, strawberry. And then we use the uh, yellow lines that are based on the uh, product temperatures as an input to the uh, quality models. So we measure the temperature of the room of the transport environment but we turn it into a product temperature that then feeds into the generic uh, quality model. There's another aspect concerning uh, the water loss. Um, in the first year, we worked with more uh, open uh, packages of uh, strawberries. And then you can imagine if you measure the humidity in the environment, that kind of equals the humidity immediately around the uh, fruit. However, this year we opted for closed uh, punnets because that's often the reality. But then you will have another humidity inside uh, your uh, punnets. Actually, the punnet will be buffered in terms of when the humidity changes in the environment, the humidity inside the punnet won't change as rapidly at all. And it will be much closer to saturation all the time ruling out any quality attributes and quality re quality related process that is driven by uh, water loss. So like weight loss, like wilting of the leaves. Um, so what we've chosen here is that we would model not the um, water loss of the fruit itself, because then we would have a need for also having a model to describe the water migration in or out of the package, but we took the package as a whole and we lumped the package as a whole into our new product. Um, and we would model the water loss for this particular uh, package configuration. So it now becomes specific for the combination of the fruit and the particular package. What is the consequence of this? Um, if you look at it from data from last year and you see on this graph different humidity levels going from 40 to 100 percent, different temperatures from zero to 30 degrees, and then the different shelf lives involved, uh, you typically see that when you go to lower temperature, your shelf life goes up, but also when you go to higher humidity, your shelf life goes up. And remember, humidity is humidity in the outside environment. This makes sense because the lower the temperature, you're inhibiting all kinds of quality processes, and uh, the higher the humidity, you're inhibiting water loss and anything related to that. However, in this year's data, if you look at the this particular package configuration, uh, you notice that the humidity impact has been almost completely ruled out. Why is that? Well, we have a much higher humidity inside the package, so weight loss is no longer a real quality issue. And um, what we now notice is that the uh, overall acceptability of the product is basically limited by processes like spoilage that is only uh, defined or largely defined by uh, temperature and less by the humidity. 
So um, the consequence of this is, first of all, the approach is package specific. So if you want to move from one client providing a bulk package um, and another client providing some consumer uh, packages that are being transported, you will have to double check whether the uh, the parameters of the models are still uh, valid. The nice thing with our approach is that the whole model structure is not going to change. So you can use the, the leave the structure intact, use the same structure, but parameters needs to be retuned for a specific product, but also for a specific package configuration. Additionally, we notice that by going to the package, and of course it's logical, uh, the whole system becomes kind of uh, humidity insensitive, which is good from a, um, the user point of view. Um, it actually uh, would reduce complexity of uh, your uh, system. I mean, eventually you could say, OK, I can leave out those quality attributes that are largely depending on humidity um, because they will. You know, the chances that they will become rate limiting are getting much lower. Um, another challenge uh, that we are uh, dealing with is that of biological variation. Any one of you active in the fresh uh, perishable area are familiar with it. Um, there will be huge variation between how crop behaves depending on cultivar season, uh, where it's coming from, uh, strawberries from Spain, strawberries from Denmark, uh, from the Netherlands, from Belgium, you name it. Uh, the different harvests, when were they harvested early in the season, uh, under which growing conditions, covered growth. Um, so there will always be variation. Uh, even within a batch, there will be variation between different fruit. So what you see here is an example on firmness of avocados, and these are actually individual fruit from a same batch. One batch where they're nicely going down kind of together, but you still see huge variation. And another batch where even um, they slow down much more in their ripening, and there's even more differences between the individual fruit. So this makes the whole thing be quite challenging. Um, there are some solutions to it. Uh, you can do an extensive characterization of the initial quality. You can look for biomarkers on uh, to have a quick method at harvest to find out is this a highly or uh, less highly perishable uh, batch. And there has been actions going on in research to come up with all kind of um, methods to characterize this. Uh, but of course, that can be quite expensive. Um, another approach is doing some accelerated shelf life testing, well known in the food area. Um, or you can include the uncertainty in your model to explicitly show that there will be some issues uh, and the model cannot never be that accurate. Um, so what we have uh, explored a bit more this half year is um, looking into the accelerated shelf life uh, testing. Of course, some considerations are, um, is it worthwhile doing? Uh, because it is an investment, so depending on the, the, the value of your product, you might decide to do it or not to do it. It also depends on the throughput of what you can do in the uh, accelerated shelf life testing. If you have many batches coming in, you also need a high capacity. Also the time required. Can we do accelerate shelf life testing in half an hour or will it take two days relative to what is the shelf life of my product? So also what we sometimes know from literature is that um, the under the accelerate shelf life conditions, the fruit might start to behave slightly different. Um, nice illustration here is an apple um, losing weight. Of course, it's a bit exaggerated, but you can imagine that it might work well for the, the weight loss as such. But for instance, um, it might not give you proper result on firmness because the kind of firmness that you measure here will be more prone to the water loss than it is to, let's say, uh, biochemical changes in your cell wall composition. So you're measuring another kind of firmness change. 
So these are things you need to be well aware of. But if you set up these tests, it will be able to give you inputs on certain product specific parameters and also packaging specific values. And the last one is mainly considering those lumped uh, heat and mass transfer coefficients that you can determine. So in our project, we have focused on uh, the impact of temperature and humidity, but we did, for instance, notice that when we do an experiment at 30 degrees, it's less representative than an experiment at 25 degrees. So the 30 degrees for spoilage is actually already a too high temperature to give proper um, realistic behavior. So how would we see this ASL procedure? Um, well, what is needed is that the moment the, the, sorry, the product is harvested and um, a batch of product is shipped to the end user, sensor is being added, goes into the supply chain. At the same time, you would need to have a representative sub batch that goes under specific accelerated shelf life conditions. During such a short experiment, you measure the batch specific parameters. You have to analyze that data, get the required parameters from it, add them to the generic structure of your uh, model, and then you can do your prediction. Of course, if we are dealing, and that's what we run into, um, with product that only has a shelf life of around two to four days, and your accelerated shelf life also takes about one and a half, two days, it is actually not uh, quick enough. So that's that's an issue uh, of what you can do with the accelerated shelf life procedure. Doing uh, a quick weight loss measurement, that's perfectly feasible because that you can do uh, within something like an uh, eight hour uh, period or less. You can measure the weight loss during certain low humidity levels and that will give you that lumped um, water loss uh, coefficient. But if you do accelerate shelf life testing for spoilage, that requires already more time and maybe more time than we can allow us for. So the other thing is trying to include uncertainty in the models. I mean, how are they are the models dealing with it? Currently, we are predicting the keeping quality and um, we even prefer to look at it from in terms of hours. So we have uh, let's say 36 or 37 hours of shelf line. And that's what the industry wants. They want to be certain. They want to know exact how much time they have. But of course, we need to be realistic. And given the variation between batches, even batches coming from the same uh, field, for instance, there always will be some uh, variation around it. So I think it is safe to include this um to introduce a certain um, sense of realism but this is something that we can only improve on over time when we have seen more and more batches going through the system and where you can check with a wide range of sources how well the actual shelf life relates to the predicted shelf life so this is um like in other similar kind of systems, it, it requires time. Another way how you can use a system is for scenario analysis. So try to move away a little bit from that exact on the dot predictions, but more use a system for what if analysis and uh, kind of performance ranking. So you have different transport chains. How did one perform over the other and where did you lose most of your initial quality? What were the weak points in your chain? What are the strong points? Where can we improve? So this is another way of dealing with the data and using the whole system. So of course, the model is only one step and we will show uh, in uh, half an hour or so in, in one of the next presentations that um, how the whole thing is being implemented and combined with the Accents uh, platform, uh, because that provides a shell around the whole software, around the, the di digital twin, to actually um, yeah, interpret the sensor data, use them as an input to the model, 
and start looking at the quality data to um, yeah, interpret the impact of the conditions on uh, quality. Uh, but that's for uh, one of the later presentations. So hopefully I've explained a little bit more about what's going on in the core of um, Digifresh. Uh, if there's any immediate questions, you can ask them. Um, and if not, then we'll leave them for the final part of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. So now the we go for Alex, Alexandro, uh, and he's going to explain us the different uh, analysis that was made uh, for validation tests of our models uh, here in Spain and also in the lab in the Aros University. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, uh, this uh, presentation is divided into two parts. First, I will talk about validation tests that we have um, yeah, performed mainly in the supply chain from Spain to Denmark. And then I will talk a little bit more about batch variation. So Martin, Martin covered some parts of it and I will show some of the real results we have obtained. Um, so to begin, let's start with the validation tests. Um, we have conducted tests on both strawberries and lettuce as we worked with these two products in 2021. We had to validate the models and we have chosen on purpose uh, quite a long shelf, uh, quite a long supply chain. You can see here it's more than 3000 kilometers if the driver was driving this specific way. And we know that if he, uh, the that um, that there was a stop in Netherlands on the way to Denmark. And uh, you can see that <clears throat> this, uh, um, it, it's also, you can imagine, it, it takes like more than two days, around two days for produce to arrive. This gives us chance to collect more real data to use in the models. Uh, and this um, validation test, we got a lot of help um, from Co-op Trading. It's a company based in Valencia. They are uh, very, they were very helpful. They provided us contact to Alimer. That's a company. Uh, it's a cooperation of growers of different fruits and vegetables and lettuce in particular and to Frutas Esther, who is a company growing different berries and including strawberries. So they have arranged also with these uh, companies that we send sensors and um, we instructed them how to install the sensors and they could uh, send them to uh, Denmark. We also visited this. so. Um, we also visited them and had meetings with, with the farmers and with these companies. So we also would like to mention and thank Frutas Esther for opening their doors, showing their growing and production. And we had very fruitful uh, discussions and uh, uh, some of the things that we tried to apply in 2022 to further improve the models. The same goes for Alimer. We had like one day meeting, meeting with them and learned uh, also a lot about their challenges and what they as producer would like to uh, to use in the supply chain as a digital tool. And I would also like to uh, to yeah, acknowledge um, my uh, colleague Merete, because she was the one who arranged all of this and she was also the one who was driving around Spain and it might look 
not so big on the map, but it's really long time driving if you're going from, let's say, Huelva to somewhere in Valencia. It takes really like two days. <laughs> yeah, um, let's um, see some results. So this is uh, uh, print screen from Accent's uh, web website from the Accent software. You can see here that this is a test with strawberries. Uh, it uh, started on 31st of January, close to midnight. So um, here on this part, on the left side, you can see product potential and it's measured in percent. And that's something that Martin already talked about, but he was showing days. In this case, for users, it was decided that we better not show days it can be confusing, so instead a percent is used. And here on the right side we have temperature and this yellowish uh, uh, curve is showing how the temperature was changing uh, during yeah, transportation and storage of strawberries. The dotted green line shows uh, the product potential change if uh, or at condition at optimal conditions. In this case, we can set in the software like any optimal condition. I have chosen one degree and 98% humidity. So you could store strawberries for more than 10 days until they lose quality. And that's more or less realistic if we get good quality of strawberries from the beginning. And then we have blue line that shows how product potential was changing as a result of changing temperature and relative humidity. And in this specific case, uh, strawberries, they, uh, they have arrived to us after around two and a half days on 3rd of February. Um, it's not far away from our research institute where Coop has their warehouse. So we went and picked those strawberries, brought them into our facilities, and then we put them immediately into simulated shelf life so you can see that the temperature goes up very fast and reaches 18 degrees and again like what we saw also from martin's presentation the, during transportation as temperature is low like here it's somewhere around two and some point it increases to <clears throat> as six degrees but yeah again for refrigerated mm, transportation that's still maybe relatively low temperature you can see the behavior of the product potential uh, curve the slope is not so high and it's slowly decreasing and uh, but once we reach the simulated shelf life conditions once the temperature goes up you can see a, a change in the behavior of the curve it goes down now much faster so uh, overall we could see from here what is predicted by digital twin is that we have lost somewhere around seven days <clears throat> in uh, in product potential uh, just because the way it was transported and the way it was sold. Of course, we know it's not realistic to to transport always at this like really optimal conditions and especially sell at these optimal conditions. So we would expect that in general, these curves would be going somewhere. Yeah, they would be, they would not be reaching like 10 days, most probably. Another thing I want to show on this curve is uh, this pinkish star. So what happened is after strawberries arrived, we start monitoring their quality. And we determine when the quality is lost. We cannot monitor the quality on hourly basis, but we try to do some discrete uh, measurements. And then we, if we observe that in one measurement quality was OK, but in the next measurement uh, there were problems with uh, quality, like quality was lost, let's say, due to rot, we try to predict a, a time that actually the quality was lost. And in this case, um, we can see that there was a seven hour over prediction um, 
based on a digital twin. So there, and it's again, like what Martin said, maybe this is just a matter of, of error because maybe next time it will be on this side, it can be positive. Um, but I want to show a few more examples before we talk about this maybe and how big is this error and what can be done with it. One that's and also another transportation of strawberries. You can see uh, again quite good transportation temperature. Unfortunately, you cannot see the the lines for temperature, but somewhere around two degrees with some minor um, uh, increases in temperature up to like five, six, seven degrees. Again, uh, the product potential curve uh, goes down really slowly until the moment strawberries are put at high temperature, then it does decrease quite fast. Uh, you can see like compare also to previous condition where we put strawberries after like two and a half days immediately at 18 degrees here. Strawberries were put after around five days at 18 degrees. Of course, this prolongs the product potential. Um, and uh, yeah. We can see again uh, some uncertainty in when the quality was lost based on model or actual quality loss. And in this case, it's seven hour on other predicted. Um, I just also want to show one more feature and it's not possible to show it from this print screens because this is already in the past, but we actually also developed a concept of future. And if you follow this purple uh, line, so here at this moment, because we do have a digital twin, we do know uh, how much of product potential was already lost at any point. And if we are right now in 26th of September, somewhere around midday, we, this quality is still not lost for this batch. If we go and check in the system, we can try and play around with what will what we predict or expect that the conditions will be. So in this case, uh, like you saw that in, in reality, more or less quality went down quite fast because the temperature was increased. But if we kept strawberries at one degree and really high humidity, you could see that uh, we could earn somewhere around two days more until the quality would be lost. So it's just an added value of having these digital twins, both uh, understand what happened in the past and try to predict what is going to happen in the future. And uh, here is like a summary of uh, the results from different uh, validation tests we have performed. Uh, you can see that in some, the relative error was really low uh, or just within, we would say, yeah, noise. Let's say of if it five percent could be considered. Uh, in some cases, though, there were uh, relative error was above ten percent and up to yeah twenty three percent. And in general, in all these tests, we could see more uh, a trend of positive error rather than negative. And I need maybe to explain what this error is. It's the time difference divided by uh, be between predicted and actual uh, quality loss time and it's divided by actual time of quality loss and um, by taking the absolute values of these relative errors we were able to calculate an average accuracy and that's uh, was 11.3 percent which is quite good um, next, I would like to show um, a validation test for lettuce. In this case, um, it was transported from Murcia region, yeah, to from Spain to Denmark. Transportation was much longer uh, because trucks are not leaving every day to Denmark. So first they had uh, to keep lettuce at their storage facilities, then load on the truck and you can see that the truck arrived here after almost five days of the harvest. 
during transportation, the conditions were not as close to like optimal as in case of strawberries. You can see the temperature was reaching uh, seven degrees, but in general, temperature was kind of high, higher than what we saw for strawberries. Uh, uh, once they have arrived to our facilities, at uh, university, we have moved this specific batch of lettuce into a room kept at one degree and uh, continued monitor and started. We measured quality here and in, in, at the heart harvest, but then we started measuring quality again after this point and onwards. And uh, well, even so, we had, yeah relatively high temperature during transportation you can see that overall we yeah last approximately three days if compared to optimal conditions and here you see we keep little bit different conditions it's also because we know that at zero degrees it's the the most optimal but we consider commercial optimal conditions for transportation yeah um here you can see this example of uh, of prediction future. It's because the shipment was stopped because we measured that quality was lost on uh, 6th of March. So after um, more than 10 days uh, after harvest, the quality was lost due to wilting. And um, yeah, we stopped the shipment. We stopped uh, this shipment in the software, but actually uh, the digital twin would predict that quality would be lost somewhere later with the 1.1 day over prediction. Again, is this critical? It depends uh, on who you're talking to. And uh, uh, here are the results of some tests we have performed. Again, we had in two tests, uh, quite low relative error and in two tests it was in between like 20 and 25 percent with relative accuracy of 14.4 again if we take absolute values from here and calculate an average yeah uh, this was the first part of my presentation and now i'd like to talk a little about batch variation and some and show some uh, real results. Um, so we were. Uh, I I will focus only on strawberries in this part. Uh, we, this here you can see strawberries from different batches. Uh, this is strawberries grown in Denmark and that were used this summer in uh, in our tests. When we look at them, mm, we see very little difference it's the same cultivar don't uh, uh, yeah this shape should not uh, make you feel that this is a different strawberry it's just strawberries can also have this shape and uh, yeah by just looking on strawberries we can't really say anything so we try to measure different parameters in this uh, for these strawberries. One of them is uh, what Martin described is this water um, loss or the lumped water loss or water permits from packages. And you could see that there were some small differences in between, but on a relative scale, we could say that there, there are not really big differences in di between different batches. And the reasons why this is happening could be also that, um, yeah, like the maybe size was slightly different, or maybe the transpiration rate of fruit was different. We don't know, but uh, you will see in the later slides a very difficult, very different figure where there is a huge variation. So maybe we could say here there is minor variation and if one is really interested, they could determine water permits and update the model. But in the, our modeling, we have used just 
average value from these five batches. There was also lumped heat uh, approach, uh, what Martin explained, to predict how temperature of product is changing with changing environmental temperature. And um, a coefficient was uh, calculated for modeling, and you can see that this coefficient is more or less similar for all five batches. So again, not really big batch variation. We have measured uh, total soluble solid content, and um, one specific batch, uh, it was more sweet, but you can also than the others maybe and uh, but in general you, we couldn't make this conclusion because you see even within the same batch different fruits they have different um, amount of total soluble solids and there is a huge variation within the batch itself uh, the same applies to titrable acidity again not really clear batch variation in this case um, in terms of firmness, if we look on averages, maybe there is some kind of trend, but again, considering big variation in within batch, there might be uh, too little batch variation in terms of, comp uh, of compression. And that's why I say too little is because like this is what we observe as batch variation, and this is something we have to uh to live with and this is relative error of prediction from the model uh, for um, product potential and you can see we had uh, some batches where prediction was relatively okay but we had especially this batch where yeah the error was just too high it was like imagine if quality was last after four days the model predicted it was last after two days so it's like really big error on average uh, relative accuracy in this specific uh, validation test was 16.1 degrees and let's look a little bit closer on what's happening and why we are having this um high in in accuracy in some cases. Here you can see results of modeling for rot from rot model. So this is not the shelf life model itself, it's a rot model. And I have chosen these three specific batches. So we have a batch here. Blue is the temperature at which uh, this batch is stored in the three different scenarios. Green dots are measured uh, rot incidence and the green line is uh, fitted model. You can see quite a good fit in case of this specific batch. We can see clear under prediction in case of this batch, and we can see a clear over prediction in case of this batch. And uh, yeah, but you can also see the uh, how was the difference that here this is day four and here is day four, here is day four. So we need to compare them. It's unfortunately the scale is not the same. So this batch on day four already was really there was a lot of rot in strawberries. Here there was little to none. And in this case, there was none. And that's why we are getting over another prediction. Uh, yeah, uh, Martin also mentioned accelerated shelf life. So one way to deal with this could be to use accelerated shelf life. Uh, but here we have the results from what we try to do is collect strawberries to the accelerated shelf life. And uh, we, uh, in this specific case, looked on rot severity of strawberries at 25 degrees after uh, a 20, 27 or 44 hour accelerated shelf life test. 
and you can see how the data fits into uh, time until the quality is lost. And we actually do see quite good correlation between the way quality is lost and results we're obtaining, let's say, from uh, accelerated shelf life conducted for 24, uh, 27 hours. But if you look on time when quality actually was lost, you can see that here it's like after in less than 10 hours, in, case, in three cases, quality was lost. But we need 24, 27 hours to predict that quality would be lost. So, yeah, it might be too late to obtain some information from accelerated shelf life tests. There could be, we are all now familiar with PCR and qPCR. And here's just an example of how it works for COVID analysis, but it's available and maybe it could be used. Uh, to to fit in the model, but there is one specific problem as we are talking about yeast and molds. We don't. It's important to to measure their activity, the activity of their spores, the sporulation, where where in the sporulation or germination, uh, let's say gray mold is. So it's not. We don't know, we haven't tried, but most probably this is not a solution. And also considering that this is an added cost for companies, it's, um, yeah, we can admit that it's really difficult to predict, to, to predict how a specific batch will rot. And that's why and also there is one more specific problem and that I want to show here. Um, when we look on the models, you can see. Uh, uh, we, we we say that quality is lost when 5% is rotten. That's the quality limit we set here. And when we develop these models. For them to pass through 5%, there is. Yeah, in, we cannot control this and it's very much also determined by how uh, where how was the road in other observations so there is uh, there should be a lot of effort on trying to predict more correct rot when it's close to five percent and not the overall rot because this is quality determining we're not interested in predicting how rot will develop further all we're interested in is when it will reach 5%. And uh, there are some lessons learned uh, already, as mentioned by Martin. Better not to do this on the dot prediction. And this on the dot, it's like, OK, right now, how much time is left until quality will be lost? So it's better to compare different shipments and make maybe make some assumptions that uh, you could assume that quality, initial quality is same, and then based on that, uh, the managers and warehouse could decide which batch to send out first, let's say. If, and if you want to predict on the dot, then you really need large number of samples to account for biological and microbial variation. And like in our case, we have five batches, so maybe that's not enough. And this is like I try to explain. I don't know if I, I was able, maybe Martin can explain it better. But when we try to predict something that is near zero and with the model that is used to predict this, it's um, yeah, it's really essential to perform like proper calibration of this model. And uh, the last thing is. Um, Shall we deal with shelf life in hours and how to deal with it? Uh, because is it really so accurate that it can tell you that quality is lost in three days? And this is an open question, and uh, I won't provide you an answer for it. And that was the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. And if we have any question at this point, I would like to answer them. And 
Thank you, Alex. We don't. Okay, so now we go for the implementation of the fresh logistic by Gidi Shani. Gidi, is your yes, turn? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Angela. Actually, we are two um, uh, representatives of uh, Xens here. We have Haim and uh, myself. So Haim will start and I will then take over. Haim will tell you more about the uh, uh, overall capabilities of, of Xens and then I will uh, elaborate on our involvement in DigiFresh in a more uh, elaborated manner. So Haim, stage is yours. My screen. <clears throat> there you can see my screen. Uh, I am, uh, my name is Haim, I'm product manager in Xsense. Um, we, <clears throat> As you see, our uh, slogan, Intelligent Cold Chain Monitoring of uh, Perishable Products, we um, <clears throat> um, we uh, are doing the uh, implementation of uh, what you heard uh, until now. And when we will uh, go deeper into the implementation uh, with uh, Dr. Gidi Shani, I will uh, just explain uh, more about uh, the introduction, what is the company is doing. So we are uh, here for uh, uh, the reason that we we are here in the presentation and we, the reason that the company is uh, uh, doing what is uh, doing is for it's because of the food waste. And I don't think that I need to explain too much about that. This is, uh, we are all on the same page speaking about that and trying to uh, solve this uh, <clears throat> uh, problem. Uh, just a background of uh, the supply chain. This is uh, what uh, the supply chain from the grow. Um, and due to the fact that our supply chain is segmented and many, the product is uh, changing multiple and from the grow, packer, exporter, uh, transporter, and importer, uh, distributor, packer, retail, it's many, many hands, and maybe it will uh, bypass some of them, so the transporter will uh, bring the stuff directly to the retailer. So each part of this uh, segment is responsible of uh, making sure that the product is maintained in the right uh, conditions according to the protocol, according to what he is uh, responsible. So uh, we provide uh, a system that will uh, monitor, uh, monitor this. Uh, how do we, how are we doing it? We are placing tags on the fresh products as you see in those pictures, if it's a pallet, if it's a box uh, or whatever. And then we are, uh, by connecting the multiple segments cold chain, we are able to generate a single and continuous display of the storage condition, providing the retail with the exact condition. So if the retail uh, wants to understand if the shipper did his job correctly and uh, it might be that he will uh, find him if it wasn't or will not accept the product even. So we will be uh, using our system and he will uh, make sure that the shipper is using our uh, tags. We can monitor many types of uh, products, uh, see fresh, uh, uh, fresh food, uh, milk, dairy, meat, flowers, ice cream, seafood. <clears throat> How do we do it? Other than the tags that you see here, uh, we also uh, have uh, readers. Our readers that will, uh, we, it's all spread out 
in the warehouses, in the ports, in the airports, and the tags are uh, transmitting the data and uploading it to the cloud. Uh, we have a couple of uh, types of uh, um, uh, loggers that we use. So this is one type. We have also cellulars that directly upload the, the stuff to the uh, cloud. And we have a simple USB that you plug in your computer, you see result, you can upload it to the system in order to view and compare uh, with us. Um, if you can see a picture of all the three components that we have, uh, we have the tags sending the uh, data to the uh, reader, which uh, uploads it to the cloud. And in the end, there was a system a platform, a mobile or desktop um, for the customer. Also, we're using uh, notifications, alerts, emails, uh, push notifications to your mobile. Uh, and many, many other uh, intelligence uh, models. We have analytics one that you can compare and find your best shipper and uh, you can uh, draw results of uh, understanding uh, through which uh, route is better to send the stuff which, and which, which uh, shipper. Uh, I wanted also to speak about, because it's connected to this uh, project, uh, an API we give uh, the bottom line, yeah, I'm not sure that you want to see all the details, how you connect with an API, which is the application program integration, that your system can ask our system uh, for information. So you can get the uh, overall information, the readings, the data, and the results of uh, what we are going to speak now about the product uh, uh, lifetime. <clears throat> we are uh, widely used. Those are points where we have uh, those uh, our readers. So we know that if you send the uh, uh, stuff to Dubai, we have the uh, uh, real-time uh, uh, reader that will upload it to the system. Or we have also uh, all over uh, um, the globe. Yes, those are a couple of uh, the primary customers that we are using our system. Um, the, the sensors that we are using, are, uh, we are currently monitoring temperature and relative humidity and the location using the GPRS uh, um, uh, antennas of the real-time uh, cellular uh, loggers. And uh, some of our customers are also interested in some door opening alerts. Like, you know, if someone uh, tried to uh, steal stuff from the container or put a uh, smuggle, etc., etc. Uh, this is how our customers see the data. Uh, this is a shipper of uh, broccoli from Kenya to Amsterdam. This is just an example. You can see how the temperature jumps. And as you saw before in the slides, how we, uh, we will see how it influences the shelf lifetime. After uh, he closes the doors and put it in a container, you see that it's in the protocol, uh, a bit above the threshold of its protocol. You see the green area is uh, at the threshold that it's uh, supposed to be. And you can see along the journey, the jumps when you open, you move between uh, um, segments that we've seen before, those segments between uh, the shippers. And uh, you can see also uh, where it, uh, look, it's located using the cellular GPRS uh, data, or maybe also where the readers are uh, receiving the data. It also indicates where the ship uh, is now. Um, this is the moment that I'm moving, uh, unless you have questions about the uh, Xsense as Xsense. And uh, now I will uh, move the 
control to Dr. Gidi Shani to explain what we are doing with the DigiFresh project, how the, we implement it in the platform. Thank you, Chaim. Um, Angela, will you give me the uh, share? You can just say share, Gidi. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Well, I think that this is your screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we, we can see a presentation. My presentation, okay. <laughs> um, no, no, I don't. No, 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 it, sorry. Was, was it was was mine presentation. Yet. Just uh, start sharing uh, the, the button. Uh, am I sharing or no? No. No. Okay, let me see. Am I sharing now? Yes. Yes, now. Okay, good. So uh, I will tell you about our role in the DigiFresh project. I may be um, repeating some of what was said. I will try and move fast uh, and not uh, uh, dwell on things that were already explained. Uh, but our role is to see how we can take this merit, this insight of uh, translating the storage conditions into the remaining shelf life of a certain uh, product uh, that was nicely explained before, how we can actually do it in real life and provide our customers with this capability. So uh, as was explained by Martin, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, things that we believe influence uh, the shelf life of fruit and vegetables are already being measured by our sensors. We uh, currently measure uh, temperature, time of course, and then relative humidity. But in the near future, we hope we'll be able to uh, monitor respiration rate by these uh, two gases. And maybe in a little bit more distant future, uh, the uh, emission of ethylene, which is um, one of the holy grails of, uh, of uh, keeping quality. So um, we started by looking at strawberries because strawberries are high value, high risk produce. And uh, we believe that the, uh, um, uh, the potential of uh, shelf life prediction model in strawberries is great. Um, as Martin nicely delineated, the model needs to be simple. It has to be generic. It has to encompass uh, multiple quality aspects like rot, uh, um, um, uh, weight loss, and, and, and etc. And it, it has to have <clears throat> very defined quality limits, meaning 5% rot, uh, five percent uh, weight loss and so on, and it is based on the measurement of multiple factors. Um, uh, as was nicely explained before, we know from the literature and from past experience that strawberries, or actually the the development of spoilage, in this case botrytis is very, very well dependent on the temperature. You can see here that a 5% threshold <coughs> is reached after two days when the strawberries are kept in 16 degrees, but uh, extends to over six days in four degrees. And this, of course, can lead to the, uh, when implementing the Arrhenius equation, can lead to the prediction of the uh, uh, development of botrytis due to uh, the uh, measurement of temperature. And uh, this is again the schematic model that was explained before. And you can see that the uh, uh, a, a certain uh, quality uh, or a certain uh, chain can be uh, keeping quality uh, to 3.5 days while uh, a different one on lower temperature can be keeping it to over 6.5 days. Um, so uh, as, as was explained, we were uh, measuring these five parameters, uh, glossiness, uh, sepal quality, spoilage, water loss, and firmness. 
and we were uh, exposing um, uh, strawberries uh, to multiple scenarios during uh, a few weeks and measuring uh, both time, temperature, and relative humidity in this case. <clears throat> Now, these are again the uh, thresholds and the uh, we're we're touching upon the uh, example that was presented before. And you can see here that when uh, this particular batch was kept in around uh, two degrees, the uh, uh, the the potential or the actual slope of these different parameters was very mild, but when the temperature was elevated to around 25 degrees, you can see a very sharp increase in the slope of uh, weight loss, which is starting after one and a quarter days right here, but the influence on spoilage was delayed as to be expected from a biological process, and <clears throat> this sigmoidal curve starts much later, but then goes up rapidly. <clears throat> so uh, this was all explained before. I don't want to dwell on this too much, and and Martin very well explained this. But <clears throat> just in a practical, in the practical realm, we had since we are measuring five different parameters of quality, uh, we had five different differential equations that were all based on uh, temperature and relative humidity. You can see here the starting conditions Q0 and the uh, limits that we have arbitrarily uh, decided upon, <clears throat> meaning that the quality would be lost when the mass or the weight uh, is losing 5% of its uh, original uh, uh, level or, or, um, or uh, attribution. Spoilage cannot proceed over 5% and, and then we call it uh, unacceptable and so on. And you can see here that the rate limiting factor or the equation that would reach unacceptability would be weight loss. <clears throat> and of course, uh, the rest of them would still allow us for uh, more, more time. But as these five differential equations all rely on the same parameters, we could consolidate them, and Martin did this with a lot of talent, uh, to one unifying uh, equation that would be quality loss based on these two input parameters, and this was done keeping 96% of the accuracy of these uh, separate equations. Uh, again, you've seen this uh, uh, example, and I want to give you the same example so I'm not confusing you too much. And again, you see how this particular batch, uh, here you see uh, temperature and relative humidity. You see how they they mirror image themselves and how the uh, when uh, the uh, batch was left, was kept uh, around two degrees, uh, the slope of the quality is uh, such and such, but then as the temperature was elevated in this particular batch was kept for almost a day at 25 degrees, you can see how sharply this uh, um, remaining shelf life really declined and how it reaches its end when it crosses the uh, vertical or the horizontal axis. Um, so how it, is this all being translated to real life? Uh, again, you've seen some of these snapshots at the presentation of Alex, and I'd like to go very slowly and maybe explain exactly what it's made of. So the dashed green line is really the potential of uh, this particular batch. It starts from product potential of 100%, and we predict that if kept on these optimal conditions, in this case, two degrees and 90% humidity, it would it would be marketable in the coming five days. Now, uh, the solid line is actually, the solid blue line is the actual temperature and relative humidity at which it was kept. 
And you can see here that if the conditions would continue, I mean, we are, this is the present moment after two days. Now, if the conditions are kept in the same, uh, the same as they were at the last uh, observation, then we predict that this batch would have something like 2.8 days. However, if now conditions are reverted back to optimal, then we predict that this particular batch would have additional uh, something like 0.7 days. So in this way, we can actually show our customers the actual potential of a certain batch, what happens when the conditions are not optimal, and what would happen if we can if we now convert to optimal conditions. You can see these slopes here, and what happens to the shelf life potential. Now this has very very um, uh, distinctive or actually immense uh, impact on the global trading of fruit and vegetables. Um, because the uh, this shelf life or this product potential is translated to a lot of uh, um, money or waste or whatever you want to call it. Um, if we now add the temperature curve on top of it, it the uh, temperature axis is here, and you can see these are minor variations, but even these minor variations going down from six degrees down to about two degrees and then up again. Um, if you are a very, if you have sharp eyes, you can see that the slope changes here. It starts a little bit uh, more, uh, uh, it starts a little steeper, eases off a little, and then, um, you know, gets back to a certain uh, slope, which represents this, uh, this, this actual temperature. Now we, as I said before, we believe that this would have a very strong impact on the, the trade of fresh produce where the actual trade uh, uh, currency would become residual shelf life times weight and not just uh, weight. Uh, with this, I'd like to uh, thank and thank you all and uh, take some questions. Um, again, our mission is to, to convey some uh, transparency uh, and in this way uh, affect the uh, actual um, level of waste that is uh, a burning problem as was uh, explained by Alex and by Khanem and others. Um, thank you. Thank you, Giddings. Okay. Okay, so maybe we can open and question and answer turn to all of you that want to ask something or have some curiosity. Here you are, all the team. It seems that we don't have any question in the in the chat, so maybe we just want to uh, say thank you to all of you to be here tonight. I uh, oh tonight, sorry, <laughs> today. Yeah. Um, uh, today here in Malaga is very rainy, a dark day, and we are not used to. So <laughs> uh, just uh, thank you. I don't know if maybe. Alex, Martin, Gideon uh, wants to include to say something, or maybe also Merete. Alex? Yeah, I, I, I would like to thank everyone who attended this workshop. And of course, it will be also available uh, online when we will communicate with you after this workshop. Um, uh, yeah. And I would like to thank every uh, partner uh, for conducting this project for two years and also AT Food for co-funding this project now that we have an opportunity to do so. 
And of course, you are welcome to contact us if you <coughs> don't feel like are as asking something right now. You can always send us an email. That's all. Exactly. For my time. Great. Thank you, Alex. And just remind uh, all of you that uh, next week we will share uh, with you the recording of this webinar together with the presentation that was made for the different part of the team. Uh, for sure, we are open to question, open to collaboration, because now it's almost the, the end of our project, but uh, we hope that we meet in another occasion and we can, can continue to research and to work for the reduction of the food waste and to develop interesting uh, technology and system as the fresh was. So thank you very much and uh, thanks again. Bye. Thank you. Good job.